So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our July GANIC membership meeting. I'm Michael Morgenthal, one of our vice presidents. You might be expecting to see our president, Emma Guest Gonzalez. She is uh, just starting a well-earned vacation. So I'm pinch hitting for her this month. Uh, so we'll let people keep coming in uh, as we have just opened up our, uh, our webinar. So hope everybody is Staying hydrated, hope some of you got a chance to go down to the parade today. I did not, but I uh, hope some of you were down there to celebrate our amazing frontline workers who helped get us through the last 16 months. Uh, so I see the numbers are still kind of building. So we'll give it just another couple of minutes to let people come on in. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you want to make sure that uh, in the chat, uh, bar that at the bottom, the blue panel, blue panel says panelists and attendees. If it just says panelists, only the nine of us are going to see your comments, not everybody else. So please make sure you are, uh, you're, you have that set for panelists and attendees. Welcome everybody. Those of you who are still coming in. My name is Mike Morgenthal. I am one of the vice presidents for GANIC, the Guides Association of New York City. Uh, I'm pinch hitting for our president, Emma Guest Gonzalez, who is on vacation right now. So um, uh, if you were expecting to see her, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, I'll be the one kind of directing the meeting tonight. We have a very uh, interesting meeting. we got a few interesting things to talk about tonight and a great guest speaker as well. Uh, so we'll give it about one more minute to let people keep filtering in. Um, and uh, we'll get started here in uh, when my clock says 6.03. I think that's when we'll actually get started. So um okay so i see the numbers are still building a little bit maybe a few more and then we'll we will get started so hope everybody has enjoyed their july 4th weekend whether it was fun or work or or whatnot it's nice to have that option this year um and uh yeah it's uh it's really exciting to see everybody out and about and starting to to get back to work which is what we all hope for for the last 16 months or so so um Okay, so I think we can get started. So I will ask uh, Patrick, our secretary, to post the agenda in the chat room so you guys can all see our agenda for this evening. And I'm also going to read down the agenda for you guys uh, so you have a chance to uh, chance to hear it as well as see it. So uh, call to order. Uh, we'll have a call for new business from the floor. If anybody has anything they'd like to discuss that is not on the agenda, you can type it into the chat. Uh, then uh, I'll have an opening uh, message the way Emma normally does. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Mel Wasserman, uh, one of our great longtime members who's going to introduce our guest speaker today, Eric Metzger, the chair of the American Society of Engineers. Uh, and then um, after that, there will be a traditional Q&A, just like there was, uh, just like we have every month. Kevin Lawrence will be monitoring the Q&A uh, for us and posing the questions. So please type those into the chat as, um, as they come up for you. Uh, and then uh, we have a few special announcements. Uh, one is we want to detail for you guys our plan, GANIC's plans to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and how you can get involved in this. Very important. It's not just uh, us. We want you guys to get involved as well. Uh, we do have an industry partner vote tonight. The ballot will go out. Uh, when the vote comes up, uh, it'll be via um, uh, via Wild Apricot as usual, and we'll leave the poll open until the uh, until tomorrow morning when we'll tabulate the final uh, results. Uh, then Patrick Casey, our government relations chair, will have a call to action, uh, asking again for your participation. And then we just have a few committee reports tonight to wrap things up. So that is where things stand. Uh, is there anybody who has anything they would like uh, to have on the agenda that is not already on the agenda? I don't know if there's anything in the chat, I can take a look. Sorry, I just clicked on the wrong thing. Okay, so uh, as you guys can see at the top of the chat, the, um, uh, the agenda is posted there. Uh, so just scroll up if you need to see the agenda, but we are going to get started. So. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today for the July membership meeting. Um, as I said, I am Mike Morgenthal, one of the two vice presidents for GANIC, and I'm pinch hitting for our president, Emma Guest Gonzalez, who's on a well-deserved vacation right now. 
Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, it's been really, really gratifying to see so many of our members getting back to work, doing what we do best, leading tours and showcasing the greatest city in the world. Uh, we know our industry is far from fully recovered, but every great journey starts with a single step and the baby steps we're taking now will hopefully morph into a full-on sprint in the not too distant future. Uh, just keep in mind, as always, GANIC stands ready to support all of our members as best we can as we finally emerge from the darkness of the past year and a half. Don't forget all of the resources that you as a GANIC member have available to you, including recordings of all of our virtual programs, such as virtual fans and PDPs. You can find those, I believe, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you also have access to the GANIC photo database and many, many other um, uh, resources that you can use as you start to get back out on the streets and leading tours. Uh, however, things like I just mentioned, including the GANIC photo database, they don't just appear out of midair. GANIC's an entirely volunteer run organization and we would love to have more members get involved in the operations of GANIC. As we're all starting to get back to work, leading tours, members of the board, committee chairs, and members of those committees uh, now have more time constraints. And therefore more than ever, we need you, our members to step up and help out. So if you're interested in serving on one of our committees, reach out to that committee chair to find out how you can help out. If you're not sure which committees we actually have at GANIC, you can see it on the GANIC website by visiting this link. Um, and, uh, and you can contact the appropriate committee chair to find out more about what the committee does and how you might be able to help out or if you have ideas. We're always looking for new ideas for whatever GANIC should be doing, whether it's something that's gonna support our membership or help promote tourism in New York City or anything else, please reach out to the committee chair, the appropriate committee chair, or you can always reach out to the board just by emailing board at GANIC.org. And really no idea is too big or too small to be considered, but keep one thing in mind, if you propose an idea, you will likely be the first choice to put that idea into motion. Uh, speaking of stepping up, we wanted to say a hearty thank you and uh, congratulations to our newest board member. Uh, that is Jonathan Tour. Jonathan, give a wave to everybody. Uh, many of you know Jonathan. He has stepped up to fill the position that was vacated when Christina Lombardi resigned uh, a little while ago as a board member at large. And we thank Christina for the year and a half of service she uh, had on the board. Uh, many of you know Jonathan, but just in case you're not familiar, he's been a guide and a GANIC member for more than 14 years, deeply involved in the certification committee since its beginning. He was the founding chair of the awards committee and a founding member of the ad hoc constitution committee for which he still serves as the chair when needed. Uh, in addition, he currently sits on the ethics committee and was a long time uh, columnist for the GANIC newsletter guidelines. So thank you, Jonathan, so much for stepping up to fill this position and welcome to the GANIC board. We really, really appreciate it. Um, now, if this sounds like fun to you, you have a chance to run for the GANIC board yourself. It is election year. Uh, so I, we just wanted to plant the seed that this fall, it's time to elect the next GANIC board to lead our organization for the next two years. Uh, I personally have been on the board for five and a half years, and I can tell you it's been extremely rewarding and satisfying work, uh, even during COVID, uh, when it became even more important for the board and the committees to do uh, what we do. Uh, but it's also really refreshing when new board members are elected uh, because they bring such new ideas and perspectives and energy to the board and by proxy to the whole organization. So if you care about your fellow tour guides and your fellow GANIC members and want to help shape the future of tour guiding in New York City and elsewhere, because we're gaining a national and international uh, reputation as a leader in the industry, you should consider running for the board. Um, all of the positions, and that's president, two vice presidents, treasurer, two secretaries, and three members at large. All of them are up for vote uh, this time. We don't uh, stagger them. And any GANIC member in good standing, whether you're a full member or a provisional member, you are eligible to run for board positions. Now I can tell you that we know of at least two current board members who are not planning to run again uh, for the next term, but there likely could be more. But that doesn't matter whether it's a position that has an incumbent or not. Each position is open for election and the more candidates we have, the more ideas our membership can consider when they are making these choices. So if you're curious about what being a board member entails, uh, in, either overall or what a specific position on the board entails, reach out to the current board or a specific board member and we're happy to discuss it with you. Just real quick, what is the timing? Nominations begin at the October membership meeting and continue throughout the month of October. You can self-nominate yourself or someone, another GANIC member can nominate uh, you as well. All nominations must be seconded by a GANIC member 
and then you have the chance to accept or decline the nomination. At the November membership meeting, the candidates will deliver their statements to the members, make their case for why they should be elected, and take questions from the membership. Ballots will go out in November, and the results of the election will be announced at the December membership meeting. If you want more detail about the process for the elections, you can visit, uh, you can look at our constitution and bylaws, which are on the GANIC.org website as well. Um, one other big thank you we wanted to throw out there uh, was to Tony DeSante. I don't know if Tony is at the meeting tonight, but Tony organized our wonderful networking event uh, last week at Azalea, uh, or Azalea, sorry, I have never pronounced that word right in my entire life, Azalea. Uh, and I don't know exactly what the final count was, but it looked like we had 50 or 60 people. It was great to see so many uh, colleagues and friends from Gannick who we've only seen virtually for the last several years. So thank you to Tony and thank you to Libby Corydon Apicella, the owner of Azalea, herself a New York City tour guide for being such a gracious host. And uh, we look forward to having more in-person events like that moving forward. Speaking of which, we are now ready to fully announce that our uh, first in-person membership meeting will be the annual general meeting, which, is, uh, which will take place Thursday, September 9th. We had to adjust the schedule slightly because of Labor Day and Rosh Hashanah. So it's going to be Thursday, September 9th, and it will be at the Museum of Jewish Heritage down in Battery Park, starting at six o'clock with check-in starting at 5.30, just as we always did pre-COVID. Uh, thanks to Bob Gelber for securing the venue. And I just want everybody to know that the board has made a decision for now, in-person attendance at Gannick membership meetings will be limited solely to Gannick members who are fully vaccinated and proof of vaccination will be required for entry, no exceptions. We are doing this to keep everybody as safe as possible. For those who are unable to attend for whatever reason, uh, we will be live streaming our membership meetings so you can uh, uh, participate uh, by viewing the live stream. But uh, if you wanna attend in person, you need to be vaccinated. So please plan accordingly. And if you're holding out on getting vaccinated, this is one more incentive for you to get your shots. So uh, with that, I hope everybody's having a great summer filled with lots of tours and lots of fun. Remember to stay hydrated out there and keep representing Gannick as you guys always do uh, to show that we are the driving force amongst tour guides here in New York City. So with that, I'd like to turn over the proceedings to uh, Mel Wasserman, longtime Gannick member, who is going to introduce our guest speaker. Mel, take it away and make sure you are unmuted, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, Eric Metzger is a transportation engineer and chief of transportation systems at the New York City office of VHB, a multidisciplinary civil engineering consulting and design firm. Eric earned his bachelor and master's degrees in civil engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. He has 20 years of experience working in the field of transportation engineering. He has been actively involved in the American Society of Civil Engineers Metropolitan Section since 2002. In 2010, Eric accepted the challenge to become the chair of the ASC Metropolitan Section's History and Heritage Committee. In taking on this position, that position, Eric had big shoes to fill the prior chairman of the committee for 30 years had been Robert Olmsted, planning director for the MTA, himself a direct descendant of Frederick Law Olmsted. Eric immediately successfully led the effort to nominate Grand Central Terminal as a national historic civil engineering landmark for its centennial in 2013. Eric also serves as the secretary of the National ASCE's History and Heritage Committee. He has given history and heritage pre presentations at the ASCE conventions held in Portland, Oregon and Miami, Florida. New York City projects with which Eric has recently had an integral part of the number seven subway extension, Hudson Yards rezoning and the Greater East Midtown rezoning. An avid sports fan, Eric was the equipment manager for the men's ice hockey team at RPI, which is an NCAA Division I team. Having grown up in the New York metropolitan area, he has been living in New York City since 2000. He has always had an interest in trains and highways, 
which together with his desire to improve traffic congestion in the area, led him to make his career at, as a transportation engineer. His godfather was a civil engineer as well, who led ASCE's effort to document the Statue of Liberty's restoration for its centennial in 1986. This was one of the reasons why he became involved with engineering history and heritage. I've known Eric for quite a few years and he's really a, a brilliant. <laughs> and he gives a great presentation. I know you'll enjoy it. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Eric Metzger. Great, Thank, thanks so much, Bill. All right, I just shared my screen here. So um, this presentation, we're gonna be talking about historic civil engineering landmarks in uh, lower Manhattan. And um, first to, um, to start off, just wanna give you a quick background about the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, it was originally founded in New York City in 1852. Uh, it's the oldest national engineering society in the United States. Uh, it started off um, as, as a small group of area residents, and it's since grown into uh, an organization that has over 150,000 members in 177 countries. Uh, the headquarters were here in New York. Uh, they moved to Reston, Virginia in 1996. And uh, the society, it's, it's organized into local sections and branches, and here, the, the local section that covers New York City, Long Island, the Lower Hudson Valley uh, is the metropolitan section and that was established in 1920. And um, ASCE's headquarters, um, the first seven were all located in Manhattan. Uh, the first four no longer exist. Um, they opened up the new headquarters on 57th Street in 1897. And that building is still in existence. Uh, it's the ASC Society House you see here and it's designated as a New York City landmark. Uh, this is about a block west of, of Carnegie Hall. And um, another former ASC headquarters that still exists here, it's the Engineering Societies building. This is on 39th Street, just south of, of Bryant Park. It's right behind the Engineers Club building. And here's a photo of that, that one. And this was originally a, a gift of, from Andrew Carnegie to four large engineering societies, the, uh, the civil engineers, the mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and the mining engineers. Now, um, ASC originally declined to accept the offer to, to move in here. They wanted to stay in their own headquarters. <clears throat> so this building, it opened up in, in 1907 and ASC subsequently moved in here in, in 1917 after they added two more store, uh, stories to accommodate them. And the last headquarters, it was the United Engineering Center on 47th Street, which is right across from the United Nation headquarters. And that building was sold and demolished uh, to make way for the, the Trump Wall Tower. So our local ASE section in New York City was founded in 1920. So last year we celebrated our centennial and we had, we had planned a number of different events to celebrate this. And, and one of them was a historical walking tour. Um, so this ended up being just a virtual event that we held as a webinar. And um, I knew that there was a lot of uh, points of interest related to civil engineering in lower Manhattan. So what I, what I did is map these out and then developed a walking tour uh, that would visit uh, a number of these different locations. And I, I think there's a link to the, the map of this in, in the chat if you haven't seen it. And um, it starts and ends in City Hall Park and it's about uh, two and a half miles long. And um, here's a, a list of the, uh, the stops on here. Uh, I'm sure many, many of you are probably familiar with some of these, these locations, but uh, today, we're, we're going to talk about the civil engineering significance related to these, these locations. So the, the first stop on the tour, it's, it's an ASC plaque, and it's, it's located in the northeast corner of City Hall Park, and it's on the east side of the Tweed Courthouse. And um, it, it's located in a, in a bed of Pacassandra. Uh, it's not very easy to find unless you know where to look. And I think when I, when I learned about this plaque about 15 years ago, I think I spent about two hours walking all over the park trying to, trying to find it. And this plaque, it marks the former location of the rotunda. And uh, here you, you can see a map from 1867 showing the location of the rotunda uh, to the east side of the old uh, New York County Courthouse. And the significance of the rotunda building in regards to civil engineering is that this marks a spot where um, ASCE was originally founded. So on the evening of November 5th, 
1852, there was a group of 12 engineers and they, they gathered together at this location and they founded the American Society of Civil Engineers and Architects. And the word architects was later dropped from the society's name after the architects had formed their own professional society. The meeting was held in the office of Alfred Craven. At that time, he was the, the chief engineer of the Croton Aqueduct for the city of New York. And the, the, the Rotunda building itself, it was, a, it was a domed Roman style building. It was New York City's first arts museum. Uh, it was specifically built to display uh, panoramas that were painted by the artist John uh, Vanderlyn. And uh, later it, it has government offices, including the, the office of the, the Croton Aqueduct Department. And this building, it stood on the site from 1818 to 1870. And uh, if, if you're curious, this is just an example of one of one of the panoramas looked like. This is the Palace and, and Gardens of Versailles. Uh, this painting is now located in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, if you head down to the south end of, of City Hall Park, you'll see the location of the former Croton Fountain. Uh, this uh, fountain once stood in this circular area. And if you take a close look, at the uh, pavers, you'll, you'll see a circular outline. And uh, one of these actually has a description of the, the fountain that occupied this site from 1842 to 1870. So on, on this spot, on uh, October 14th, 1842, the uh, completion of the current water supply was celebrated. So a, a 50 foot high uh, geyser of water shot out um, from the fountain. Uh, that came from the aqueduct and was accompanied by a hundred gun salute. So uh, it was a pretty, pretty big event. People were given the day off from work. Uh, there was a long parade, uh, much longer than today's. It went from the battery all the way up to Union Square and then back to City Hall Park. And um, the original fountain, uh, it uh, had a hundred foot diameter. It was the, the city's first decorative fountain. And it, it stood here until 1870 until it was demolished to make way for a federal post office. And uh, if you're thinking, why was this fountain so large? Well, at, at that time, New York City, it was coming out of a, another uh, public health crisis. That was uh, a cholera uh, epidemic that was caused by polluted water supplies. So you could look at this as, as really a celebration of, of New York City's uh, new source of clean drinking water. And uh, the, the current water supply system, um, this is the map that just shows the, the components. Uh, it was basically a 40 and a half mile long gravity fed uh, aqueduct from Westchester, Manhattan. Um, it included the first significant masonry dam in the United States, uh, also the high bridge across the Harlem River, and then two reservoirs in Manhattan, uh, a receiving reservoir, that's now the present site of the Great Lawn in Central Park, and then a distributing reservoir, uh, the current site of the New York Public Library. And um, this project, it was designed by civil engineer John Jervis. Uh, he's the person who the, the city of Port Jervis is named after. Uh, it was a mar remarkable civil engineering uh, achievement for its day. And it really was the prototype for, for later water supply projects that were completed throughout the world. And this particular uh, project, it was designated as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark by ASE in 1975. And uh, if you just turn around from the spot, you'll see the, the Park Row building. And um, I'm sure all of you are probably aware that this stretch of Park Row was the center of the newspaper publishing industry uh, from the 1840s to the 1920s, and it was nicknamed Newspaper Row. And uh, several of the newspapers, they embraced the concept of building skyscrapers in the late 19th century. So the Park Row building, it's an example of an early skyscraper that used uh, structural steel in the design of its metal frame. And uh, interestingly, when, when this building was in its planning stages, uh, many people, they, they doubted if skyscrapers would be successful. And an example here is just a, a quote from uh, Joseph Freitag's 1901 book on architectural engineering. And you could see, uh, he said, it, it's very doubtful um, if it will be found either desirable or profitable to erect other buildings as high as, as this one. So def definitely different thinking at, at that uh, point in time. Uh, this building was, it's uh, 391 feet tall. It was a, the tallest building in New York City from 1899 to 1908. Uh, the structural engineer was Nathaniel Roberts. Uh, 
The building uh, foundation, it consists of approximately 3,900 spruce piles that are driven into sand. And one interesting thing about this building is that it employed Roebling's concrete floor system. So that's the same Roebling you probably know from the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, this system, it was introduced by John A. Roebling Sons and Company. It was the first concrete fireproof floor system to be used in the United States. And back in the 1890s, uh, New York City's building code, it required buildings to be fireproof, but it didn't allow for concrete floors. So after a lengthy uh, battle, the superintendent of buildings uh, approved the use of Roebling's concrete floor system. And this was a lighter and a cheaper alternative to the previous use of, of terracotta floors that were supported by brick arches. So the next stop on the tour, this is the Bennett Building. This is on Nassau Street between Ann and Fulton Streets. Uh, this was constructed between 1872 and 1873, subsequently enlarged from 1890 to 1894. Uh, it's considered to be the tallest occupied building with cast iron facades that has ever been built. And it's, it's one of the few remaining post-Civil War office buildings that exist in lower Manhattan. Uh, what's unusual is that the, the cast iron facade of this building, it wraps around all three street frontages. Um, in the uh, original building, it had uh, six stories. When it was expanded with four more stories um, and a two-story penthouse in the 1890s, uh, the facades were also made of cast iron, so they would match the rest of the building. Uh, even though at that time, the use of, of cast iron facades had, had gone out of fashion. And uh, another thing that's unique is that this has two bearing wall cast iron fronts and one non-bearing wall cast iron front. So normally cast iron uh, was only used for a single wall that was non-bearing in buildings. And uh, th this photo, you could see the Southern facade. This is from 1893 after it was expanded. And then the, uh, the next stop, this is the, uh, the location of the former Chamber of Commerce building. Today, this is occupied by uh, one Chase Manhattan Plaza. And um, this is actually the, the first location of, of ASC's headquarters. Um, the original meetings for the society um, they were held at the Rotunda, but then the society went dormant for 12 years. So uh, one of the first objectives was to get a headquarters. So they, they rented two rooms here at 63 William Street. Uh, the annual rent was only $400, and that, that was even considered to be a, a bargain in those days. And um, the first uh, annual meeting of the society was held here in 1867. James Kirkwood was elected as the second president. And just as, as a bit of trivia, uh, Kirkwood, he was an engineer. He worked on a lot of railroads in his career. He actually had two towns named after him, Kirkwood, New York, and Kirkwood, Missouri. And he's buried in uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And those two towns actually restored his headstone at, at his gravesite in 1997. And the next stop on the tour, this is 40 Wall Street, uh, the former headquarters of the Manhattan Company. So there, there's really two things of civil engineering significance to this location. The first is that being the headquarters of the Manhattan Company, technically that was New York City's first water supply system. But actuality, you know, it was a clever ruse by Aaron Burr to create the, the bank to compete against the other city's uh, two banks that were influenced by Alexander Hamilton. Um, water supply system was not very successful. Um, the, the company only dug wells on the island and over pumping near rivers, it led to saltwater intrusion and also unsanitary conditions on the island caused some of the, the water sources to become polluted. So that's quickly spread diseases. So the, uh, that cholera epidemic that uh, killed 3,500 people in 1832 which is about 2% of the city's population, uh, you know, that's something that led to the development of the, the Croton Aqueduct. And the other thing of civil engineering significance about this site is that uh, the skyscraper that, that stands there today, which is originally known as the Manhattan Company building, is that when it was completed in 1930, it was Wurtz Tallest building, but only for a very brief period, you know, less than two months. And, you know, in this diagram, you could see the progression of the world's tallest buildings from 1908 to 1972, all of which were in New York City. 
uh, 40 Wall Street, Wall Street being 928 feet tall, it surpassed the Woolworth building. However, you know, there was an intense rivalry between this building and the Chrysler building for the title of the tallest building. And Chrysler building surpassed it when they pulled out the spire that they had been hiding. But then again, they only lasted as the tallest building for a year when it was surpassed by the Empire State Building. So the next stop on the tour, this is the American Surety Building at 100 Broadway. Now, when this uh, building opened up in 1896, it was the first office building in New York City that had an all steel frame. So that's containing bolt steel columns and uh, beams. Up until that time, uh, the city's tall buildings, they use cast iron columns or less commonly wrought iron columns. And uh, the steel frame, it was completely protected by fireproof terracotta blocks uh, and is supported by uh, a cantilevered steel foundation that rests on pneumatic case on piers that were sunk 72 feet down to bedrock. And uh, as, as the American surety company prospered and expanded, uh, the building was expanded by four bays along both Broadway and, and Pine Street. And then a two-story penthouse was added on top of the building. Uh, one block to the, the north of this is the Equitable Building. And uh, this 538-foot uh, high tall building, it opened in 1915 as the headquarters of the Equitable Life Insurance Society. Uh, up until this uh, building, uh, prior skyscrapers such as the Metropolitan Life and the Woolworth Buildings, uh, they were designed as tall and, and romantic structures that uh, showcase the, the reputation of the companies that occupy them and the architects. And this, this was definitely not the case for the equitable building. So af after the company had a, a fire destroy their prior headquarters at the site, they, they decided instead they wanted to build the largest possible building that they could squeeze onto the site. Uh, in, in most areas, if, if you look up, the building rises up from the street for nearly uh, 40 stories without any setbacks. Um, th this building, it, it contained approximately 1.2 million square feet of rentable office space. Uh, it's the largest amount of enclosed office space in the world. And it, it remained the, the largest office building in the world by floor area until the sh Chicago's uh, Merchandise Mart opened up in 1930. And uh, the building had a masonry facade. It was uh, built with brick, limestone, granite, and, and terracotta. Uh, the overall structure it weighs more than uh, 280,000 tons. It, it was the heaviest structure on earth. And the foundation goes down 85 feet into bedrock below the surface. Uh, they sunk 80 caissons into the ground to support the interior columns of the, the building. And uh, at, at the time this building was constructed, uh, New York City had a variety of different building codes, but, but all these were aimed at, at preventing fires. There, were, there was no municipal code that um, regulated the height or shape of, of office buildings. So uh, that, that changed with the passage of New York City's first zoning resolution in 1916, uh, which limited the, the heights in buildings and, and required setbacks to allow light and air to reach the, uh, the street. And I think it's ironic too, this, this building actually hosts the offices of, of New York City Department of City Planning, um, who uh, maintains the zoning resolution. Now, anyway, if you just walk across the street uh, from the Equita building, you can see in the background, but there's a plaque and you can see this is marking the founding of the American Institute of Architects. And uh, if you remember earlier, I mentioned when uh, ASU was first formed, it was originally called the American Society of Civil Engineering Architects and Architects was dropped after the architects had uh, formed their own professional society. So ironically, here's a, a plaque right here. Um, the, the next stop on this tour, um, it, it's a pedestrian footbridge that's located behind Trinity Church. So this spans over Trinity Place uh, and it connects the church with the parish center. Uh, the, the purpose is to provide a safer crossing for parishioners traveling between the two buildings. The, the nearest crosswalk here is over 200 feet away. And uh, it goes right, it goes into the uh, brand new Trinity Commons high rise, which opened up this year. But um, this, this building wasn't always here. Uh, if, if you go back to Google Street View, here's an image from August, 2016. It shows it as being the bridge to uh, nowhere. So you might, you might think this was a historic bridge that um, was preserved, but um, although, although the bridge looks old, it, it's only existed since 1988. 
and um, the architectural design of this bridge, uh, it required approval from the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. So it, it was based on a cast iron pedestrian bridge that once existed in the area. And this is the uh, low bridge at the intersection of Broadway and Fulton Street that was constructed in 1866. And here you could see a, a drawing of what the, the low bridge used to look like. So the, uh, the pedestrian bridge, the, the new bridge that's made of steel, it's 85 feet long and it employs a Varendeel truss arch that's only 16 and a half inches deep at its midpoint. So uh, the Varendeel uh, truss is a special type, but it allows for a graceful appearance and also for ample ver vertical clearance for, for trucks to pass under. Uh, it's, it's named after Arthur Varendeel, which is a Belgian civil engineer. And uh, there's columns that are inst installed on the east sidewalk. And the reason for this is to minimize the load on the masonry retaining wall. So the, the portion of the bridge that runs between the wall and the columns, uh, it just acts as a cantilever. And this bridge, uh, it was fabricated in one piece, and then it was erected within three hours on a weekend to, to minimize traffic disruptions. Uh, next stop on the tour, this is the West Street building, located at 90 West Street, just south of the, the World Trade Center. Um, this uh, building is completed in 1907, 25 stories. It was built by the West Street Improvement Company. That was a syndicate of downtown business interests um, to target the shipping industry. Um, although it's a couple of blocks away from today's waterfront, it was it was located directly across the streets, uh, directly across the street from the docks when it was constructed. And the the main tenant was the Delaware Lackawanna and Western Railroad Company. They they rented the twenty the seventeenth through twentieth floors. This particular building it was designed by architect Cass Gilbert and the Norwegian American structural engineer Gunvild uh, Ass. Uh, the same team that would design the Woolworth building several years later. And one of the, the challenges with, with building this, uh, this structure is that it was located on landfill. Uh, the original Manhattan shoreline was located several blocks to the east on, on Greenwich Street. So when uh, when Oss, when he, he designed a, a timber pile foundation, but to, um, to quell concerns of the underwriter, uh, the general contractor solicited advice from other engineers, uh, and they had some concerns about the, the softness of the subgrade material. So they suggested some uh, changes that would further strengthen up the foundation. And uh, on September 11th, uh, the building was severely damaged during the collapse of the South Tower and also when uh, aircraft debris fell on the, the, uh, the north facade. So there was fires that lasted for days within this building. Um, and it's, it's believed that the building survived the fires because the original terracotta fireproofing materials protected the, uh, the steel structure. The, uh, the next stop on the tour, this is the former location of the Hudson Terminal, uh, which has since been replaced by the, the World Trade Center. And um, before uh, Penn Station opened up in 1910, there was no direct rail service between New York City and New Jersey. So uh, there were the terminals of six different railroads. They were all located on the west shore of the Hudson River in Hoboken, Jersey City, and Weehawken. And in order to get to Manhattan, passengers had to transfer to uh, ferries. Uh, these are crowded. Sometimes they were delayed due to weather conditions. So all the way back in 1873, uh, the Hudson Tunnel Company was formed to construct a tunnel under the Hudson River. So that would enable passengers from New Jersey to continue on trains into Manhattan. So construction of the tunnel began in 1874, but it wasn't completed until more than three decades later. And this was because of, of financial difficulties, challenges faced in construction and accidents. Uh, as, as an example, uh, a serious blowout of the tunnel occurred in 1880 when a, a leak developed and the tunnel became flooded with river water. So 28 men were trapped inside. Uh, eight managed to escape through an airlock, but the remaining 20 workers were killed. Um, beginning in, in 1889, uh, construction efforts shifted to using a tunneling shield, which you could see here in this uh, photo. And this is a similar type of method that had proven successful in the, the London subway. 
Uh, the first set of, of tunnels, uh, they were known as the Uptown Tubes, opened up in 1908. Uh, these provided a connection between uh, the Lackawanna Terminal in Hoboken and 19th Street in Manhattan. Um, there was also a second set of tunnels, the Downtown Tubes. They opened the following year, providing the connection between Jersey City and the Hudson Terminal. In the Hudson and Manhattan uh, Tunnel, it was the first railroad tunnel that was built under a major river in the country. And also it introduced the shield system of subaqueous tunneling to the United States. So this, this really served as a proving ground for new under, underwater tunneling methods and also as, as a training school for engineers that would later become uh, leaders in uh, shield driven tunnel construction. And this, this uh, project, it was designated by ASE as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark in 1978. And, um, Here's a photo, it shows um, what the Hudson Terminal used to look like. Uh, there was two 22 high, uh, story high office buildings. Uh, in the early years, the, the railroad was well patronized, but then ridership dropped after the, the Great Depression and when the Holland and Lincoln tunnels opened. So the, the company went into bankruptcy. So as, as part of the uh, agreement to develop the World Trade Center, the Port Authority agreed to take over the railroad. They renamed it to the PATH. And then they shifted the location of the proposed World Trade Center complex from the South Street Seaport over to the site of the Hudson Terminal. So then uh, if we're actually walking on this tour, one thing that's cool is you could walk underground through the, uh, the Day Street passageway and then pop up on, on ground level at, at uh, the Fulton Center. And then uh, if, if you pop out and go right across the street, you'll get to 222 Broadway, uh, which is the next stop. And um, this building, it was completed in 1961, 31 stories. It served as the headquarters for the Western Electric Company until 1984, when it was acquired by AT&T. And uh, at, at the time the skyscraper was built, it was the tallest welded steel frame in the Eastern United States. And if, if you were to compare this of a skyscraper of the 1930s, such as the Empire State Building, uh, it contained modern elements such as the use of both field and shop welding and its connections, and also uh, the use of a metal deck in uh, its concrete slab. And then uh, the next stop, this is the uh, the Woolworth building a couple blocks to the north. Um, so at a height of uh, 792 feet, uh, it was the tallest building in the world from 1913 to 1930, when it was suppressed by uh, 40 Wall Street. And uh, really the, the idea of uh, suppressing the height of other buildings to advertise uh, Woolworth's company, it really pushed the design of this project to increasing heights uh, first higher than the Singer building and then higher than the Metropolitan Life Insurance Tower. So this was also designed by architect Cass Gilbert and structural engineer Gunvild Ass, the same team that worked on the West Street building a few years earlier. Uh, it has a portal brace steel frame. It's supported on reinforced concrete piers that are built on pneumatic caissons and uh, ultimately bearing on rock. What made the design and construction of this building challenging is that the, the overburden on the site uh, consists of alluvial mud and sand. Uh, the floors, they were built with flat tile arches and the facade is entirely clad in architectural terracotta. Now, the, the lack of any expansion joints in the facade, which, which was a typical feature at the time, it led to high compressive forces and uh, the eventual deterioration of the facade. So this was addressed by a restoration that started in the late 1970s. And uh, over 20,000 panels were replaced with uh, fiberglass reinforced polymer concrete and uh, approximately 100,000 pounds were, were re-angered. And then the next stop, this was the uh, one block underground subway line that ran under this block on Broadway from, from Warren Street to, to Murray Street. Um, so back in the, uh, the 19th centuries, if you look at New York City's transportation facilities, they, they advanced from horse-drawn streetcars to elevated trains. Uh, but, but late in the century, they were being taxed beyond capacity. So engineers were looking to uh, an underground solution to, uh, to add new transportation lines and also eliminate the nuisances that were caused by elevated 
uh, railroads in the densely populated Manhattan. So uh, you know, fortunately, underground railroads became a possibility. Uh, so this was constructed by the inventor Alfred Eli Beach, who was editor of Scientific American. And it was uh, a subway that was driven by pneumatic power and it opened in 1870. Uh, the tunnel, it was eight feet in, in diameter, 312 feet long, and it was constructed in a span of just uh, 58 days using a tunneling shield. And uh, it had an eight foot long car, could carry about 20 passengers. So it was blown through the tunnel by a hundred horsepower fan. Then the blower was reversed to create a, a partial vacuum and suck the car back through the tunnel. Um, the subway was open to the public. Uh, passengers were charged a 25 cent fare to ride back and forth. Um, it had a station in the, the basement of the Roger Peep building at the southwest corner of, of Warren Street. And it, uh, in its first year, it attracted over 400,000 riders that wanted to see what a, what a proposed subway might like would look like. So, although uh, Beach he actually received a charter to extend the line uh, to, from the Battery to Columbus Circle, uh, it was closed down uh, because of a combination of factors, including uh, declining public support, uh, innovation in electric traction motors, and then also a stock market trash, uh, crash. So although this project was short-lived, it helped to demonstrate the, the uh, practicality of constructing an underground uh, railroad in Manhattan. And uh, ironically, the, ne the next stop on the tour is the first New York City subway uh, right across from the uh, park. So here's an entrance to the Brooklyn Bridge City Hall station. And um, here's a map that shows uh, New York City's first subway line. Um, north is oriented to the right. And if you just overlay this with the, the current subway, you could see that it followed the route of the 456 to Grand Central Terminal, then took the shuttle over to Times Square, and then followed the route of the uh, the 123 to the Upper East Side. So the, the awkward alignment that goes across 42nd Street, it's something that was chosen because property owners uh, on Lower Broadway opposed the construction of a, a subway in their area. And, uh, Construction of the subway began in uh, 1900. It opened up in 1904. And really, th this project, it was a trailblazer in construction techniques. Uh, much of the original tunnel uh, consisted of concrete jack arches that were between steel beams and columns for the subway roof and sidewalls. It was also an extensive use of, of reinforced concrete. Uh, other techniques involved shield driven uh, underwater tunnels lined with cast iron segments, concrete lined tunnels that were mined through earth and rock, and then elevated steel structures. So this, this set the pattern for successful rail transit uh, construction for many years. And also many tall buildings had already been constructed in lower Mid midtown Manhattan. So construction methods had to be adapted to protect these buildings that line the route, uh, maintaining uh, street traffic, um, they required elaborate and substantial decking over the subway excavation, and also the networks of, of uh, subsurface infrastructure, such as sewers, water mains, gas piping, electric lines, all had to be maintained and rerouted to make uh, room for construction of the, the subway line. Uh, so this, the first New York City subway is jointly designated as a National Historic Civil and Mechanical Engineering by ASC and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 1978. And then if you just turn and look east, you'll see the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, which was the, the last stop on the, the walking tour. Um, I'm sure everybody's probably familiar, very familiar with this bridge. It, it's really considered to be the most influential bridge in the United States history. Uh, first to, to use galvanized steel wire for cable construction. Um, when, it, when it opened up, it was the longest bridge in the world and it was 50% longer than any bridge previously constructed. Um, for, for several years, the, the granite towers, 276 and a half feet, were the tallest structures in the Western hemisphere. And if, if you look at this photo, you can really see how tall they were compared to anything else um, in, in the area. And uh, Roebling, he intended the, the towers and their, their prominent arches to serve as great monuments to the, the adjoining cities in New York and, and Brooklyn. And uh, one other thing with the, the bridge too is the pedestrian walkway. Uh, Roebling, he intended a uh, walkway to be in the bridge's original design, and he deliberately placed it above the roadway because he, he felt that such a promenade would be of incalculable value in such a crowded commercial city. 
And now uh, the Brooklyn Bridge was designated as a National Historic Soldiering Landmark by ASCE in 1972. So you've heard um, me mention that some, some of the stops on this tour have been designated as National Historic Soldiering Landmarks. Uh, this was a, the landmark program was established by ASCE in 1966. Uh, to date, there's been over 280 projects that have either been designated as national or international historic sylvanary landmarks. And here you could see one of the, uh, the plaques um, that have been mounted on the Brooklyn Bridge. There's, there's one mounted on each tower next to the pedestrian walkway. And uh, what, what does it take for, for a project to be designated as a national historic sylvanary landmark? Um, here, here's the criteria. It has to be at least 50 years old. Um, it has to be of, of national historic civilian significance. It must have uh, some sort of uniqueness or made some sort of uh, significant contribution and also has uh, must have uh, contributed to the development of the nation or a very large area. So uh, within uh, the, the metropolitan section, there's 14 different projects that have either been designated as national or international historic cemetery landmarks. Uh, here's a list of them. And uh, we saw a couple of these on the, this tour, the Corona Water Supply System, the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, the first New York City subway, and then the uh, Hudson and Manhattan Railroad Tunnel. And then uh, if you wanna learn more about uh, civil engineering projects in our area, here's two sources of information. Uh, one is we, we do have a, a guide um, to civil engineering projects in and around New York City, uh, 140 page guidebook. Um, the second edition, it was published in the 2009. Um, something we're, we're thinking about updating, but in these days, maybe uh, an electronic guide might be something more practical. And also if, if you wanna learn more, uh, you could visit the history section on the, the ASC Met section website. So this has a lot of diff, uh, detailed information about the uh, historic civil engineering landmarks in our area. So with that, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Eric, thank you so much. That was really, uh, really wonderful presentation. I'll turn it over to Kevin Lawrence, who I think there are one or two questions uh, from our audience. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eric. That was great. Um, the longer I've been a tour guide, the more I wish I had actually become a civil engineer. And I know my parents feel the same way. So thanks for bringing that up, Eric. Uh, but our first question from Peter Cohen, uh, do you think New York City is acting with appropriate dispatch to stabilize and repair, replace the 75 year old BQE in Brooklyn Heights? Uh, I mean, I'm, I haven't worked on this project, so I'm, I'm not too familiar with it, but I know that, I mean, it is a complicated structure that triple triple cantilever you're probably all familiar with that runs under the uh you know the brooklyn the brooklyn promenade um you know i know a couple of years ago i think they were starting to do uh you know an environmental uh, impact study um i mean I've, I've worked on um you know a number of, of different um projects like this you know I, a lot of these things they really take a long time with uh you know planning and you know particularly doing all the environmental like for instance with when i worked on the the number seven extension project i we started in uh 2003 you know so obviously that you know was many many years before it opened up but you know really there, there's a lot of planning that that goes into these projects and a lot of it you know really looks at all the different alternatives you know looking at the the advantages and disadvantages of projects you know whether it's it's the cost the, the construction impacts you know how, how it's gonna what's gonna look like after um so you know there's really a lot of stuff that that goes into these pro projects and it's really one one of the things that's kind of challenging about being you know, a civil engineer, particularly, you know, in Manhattan, where we don't really have, you know, lots of flexibility with, uh, you know, lots of lots of open area. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you clarify the term pneumatic pilings referred to in building foundations? Uh, I mean, I think it's pneumatic pilings just, you know, piled down with pneumatic power. So, you know, I'm 
I am a, a transportation engineer. So, you know, with, within civil engineering, there are lots of different types. There's, you know, structural engineering and uh, geotechnical engineering, environmental engineering, you know, a lot of different stuff. So, I mean, I only really dealt with kind of the, the basic stuff when I was in college. Um, so, but I, I think that, that that's what some of that stuff is. But, you know, looking at some of these buildings, you know, it's interesting just to see all the different types of foundations that, you know, are, are really used to kind of, uh, you know, to, to secure these things. And, you know, that that's why uh, there are so many build, you know, skyscrapers in lower Manhattan and Midtown just with the proximity of a bedrock to the surface. Okay, thanks. So as a travel uh, civil engineer, the next question is about the gateway project. How fast do you think we should be moving on that particular project? Uh, well, that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a critical project for Can our- Can you explain it to maybe some of our members who might not know what the gateway project is? Sure, I mean, the gateway project is basically building two more um, railroad tunnels underneath the, uh, the Hudson River. Right now, there, there's only two tunnels that go between Penn Station and New Jersey. Uh, they're very old. They were also damaged during Hurricane Sandy with, with salt water. Uh, so really, you know, the gateway project, it is to increase capacity um, for train service between New Jersey and, and, and New York City, but also to pr pr provide redundancy so that, you know, the, those existing tunnels, you know, they could be repaired, you know, shut down so that, you know, the people could still travel. And I, I think, uh, it, you know, if you look at the Trans-Hudson, um, you know, options, there, there's really not that much. There's the, uh, you know, the PAT train, and then you have the Port Authority bus terminal. Um, you know, the bus terminal is, is another project. I think that if you look at the express bus lane and, and the Lincoln Tunnel, I think it actually, you know, carries more bus passengers across the Hudson River than the rail lines do. So it, it's definitely, it's a very integral uh, project, you know, to, um, you know, for traveling between New York, New York City, or New Jersey and New York, sorry. Okay, great. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, please do post it in the chat. Um, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you, uh, Eric. It, one has to do with, you were, you were showing those pavers and the plaques for the, Ho uh, the Croton Reservoir fountains. And I'm just curious, to what degree was ASCE, were they involved in actually designating those places or who has, I'm sure somebody on here knows this, uh, who has the rights to, who, who, who prepares those and designates those particular pavers? It, I mean, that, that wasn't ASCE. We, we have, there is an ASCE plaque for that landmark, but it's all the way up on the, uh, the dam. Um, it's on the, uh, the new Croton Dam right, right now. So I don't, I don't know if that was, maybe it was the parks department when the city, when city hall park got restored. I think that was during the Giuliani administration. Okay, thanks. Uh, Michael, you had a question? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Eric, since you're a transportation civil engineer, I have to ask you kind of a two-part question. Uh, any thoughts about the work on extending the Second Avenue subway uh, in terms of challenges or if it's going to be done, you know, before our great-great-great-grandchildren are born? Uh, and number two, kind of more general question, if you had unlimited budget, what would you do from a civil engineering standpoint to, uh, to the subway system? Would you expand it? And if so, where? or fix things with what just kind of overall thoughts on the subway system moving forward? Um, so the, I mean, the second Avenue subway, I think the second phase, so that's going north from the Upper East Side and across west towards uh, Harlem. I mean, you know, it's, it, one of the things that's, that's challenging about constructing the, the subway now is, is just, you know, Manhattan is still so, uh, you know, built up. Um, it, it, it costs a lot more money to, to do construction. Um, you know, you know, taking, you know, note there's residents there, there's the businesses, you know, I think if you look back to the construction of the, the original subway system, you know, in the early 1900s, you know, it, it, you know, it was a, you know, a lot different in terms of what was done. And now there's, there's a lot more regulations, environmental regulations, you know, noise and, and air quality. So, uh, 
def definitely challenging. And I, and I think, you know, I'm not a, a geotechnical engineer, but, um, you know, I, I did know some people that were working on the, the first phase of the, the second Avenue subway, you know, and it's just very, very challenging, um, you know, going through the topography of, of Manhattan. I think, you know, they, some of the areas, they, they couldn't use a tunnel boring machine, a, a TBM. Um, so they, you know, they had to do excavation, um, they had to do mining for, for caverns, they might, other locations, they might have used soil freezing to, to, to get stuff through. So, you know, it's very, um, you know, very challenging. Obviously, all the utilities that are there that, that need to be replaced. So, you know, it's definitely a very important project. Um, I'm a resident of the east side of Manhattan, so it takes me a long time to get to the subway. So I don't know if I obviously see the, the second Avenue subway go by my house in my lifetime, but definitely, you know, a very important project. And, you know, I think o overall, you know, if, if you were, you know, to look at, you know, enhancements to the, the subway system, obviously there, you know, there's lots of stuff that could be done, you know, some projects that, you know, were proposed and, you know, shelved, uh, you know, for example, like uh, extension to LaGuardia Airport, but, you know, uh, you know, at, at, you know, at the, you know, really a lot of the stuff, you know, comes down to, uh, you know, budgets and, you know, funding and, you know, and it's really trying to, uh, you know, to, to go forward with, you know, projects that, you know, make sense and, you know, that are supported, you know, and, and you could do. So, you know, it's really difficult to try to, you know, plan this stuff. I mean, I, you know, to give you an example, I, I the, the gateway project that we just um, talked about, I worked on an iteration of that, I think in about 2005, back then it was called access to the region's core. So I spent one or two years working on that. And then it was, it was canceled by uh, Governor uh, Christie. So pretty much all my work for two years kind of went down, went down the drain. But, <clears throat> you know, if you were to look at, at that project, if we had, if that was constructed, you know, we wouldn't be in the situation right now with the, with the gateway where, you know, if, if you know, the, the tunnels underneath the Hudson River, if something happens to them, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult for people to travel between uh, New York City and, and New Jersey. Great. We have a couple more questions that are, I think, very interesting. Uh, what, this is probably the most provocative question. I'm very curious about this. What would a typical ASCE member say about Robert Moses? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what they would say, but interestingly enough, I actually helped with the transcription of a interview that was done with, by ASCE with Robert Moses. So I don't remember when it was done, but I was actually given uh, two CDs and uh, they had a professional transcription company kind of, uh, you know, go through it, but they were looking for somebody local to, to clean up the transcription. So, I mean, I, I thought it was actually very interesting because I actually got to hear Robert Moses kind of talking about uh, engineering and stuff. And what, was, what I really remember is that anytime he wanted to make a, a point, he would bang his fist like on the, on the table. So, uh, you know, if that gives you any, any indication of, uh, you know, what type of, uh, you know, person, uh, you know, person he was. So, you know, I guess it would be, uh, you know, I guess, you know, looking at, you know, the stuff that he, uh, you know, achieved with the, you know, highway system. I mean, he definitely, you know, did a lot of stuff, but, you know, in, in retrospect, you know, even, you know, uh, you know, when uh, Robert Caro's book, you know, came out, obviously, you know, a lot of other people had different uh, op opinions of, of him. But, uh, you know, I think if, if you just look back at all, all the different, you know, projects that have his name, you know, it was pretty, pretty uh, remarkable that he was able to get, uh, you know, so, so many, uh, you know, so many things done. Yeah. So from one really fascinating New Yorker to another, uh, you heard, uh, somebody heard, it's, this is a question from Mike Grant. He said, I heard somewhere that after the Brooklyn Bridge's completion, Emily Roebling was awarded an honorary engineering degree. Is that true or not? And if so, do you know by what organization? I, I don't know the, the specifics about that. I know that even, you know, they're, they're you know, definitely interesting, uh, 
interesting story with the uh, the Roeblings. I mean, and uh, you know, I, I graduated from RPI as as did uh, you know Washington Roebling. So you know, I think if if you talk to some engineers, you know, some people, uh, you know, they might question how much of a role Emily had. But you know, if you read other other sources, you know that you know, she trained herself in, in higher mathematics, you know, and she was basically relaying all of Washington's instructions. So, you know, I don't, I don't know the, the specifics about that, but uh, definitely, definitely an interesting story with the, with the Roeblings. Yeah. So as a last question, I just got done doing a tour of Hudson Yards and people are infinitely fascinated by Hudson Yards and we've touched on so many of the issues that you talked about today. You talked about a lot of earlier historical uh, landmarks. Uh, is there anything in the 21st century in terms from a civil engineering perspective that you find really fascinating in New York City? Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to think if, if anything pops out into my mind. I mean, you could, Hudson Yards is def, definitely a very, interesting project is <clears throat> just reclaiming all this uh you know underutilized space you know warehouses and, and, and train yards on the the west side of manhattan um you know i, I think uh, you know I, I think now you know in these days you know we're starting to see some of the interesting things are you know with, with climate change um you know we're, we're trying to improve the city's uh resiliency against uh, flooding. Um, I, I know that our local section of ASC, we actually had a, a seminar uh, called like storm surge barriers for, for New York City. And I think it was like 2008 or 2009. And I actually helped run the, the website for the, the Met section. I remember a couple of days after Hurricane Sandy, I checked our stats and it just shot up because like every, everybody was, was looking at that. So you know, that's definitely one thing. And then, of course, now all with the uh, sustainable, um, you know, sustainability is really a, a big thing now, how to incorporate sustainability into, uh, you know, buildings and also with, you know, construction materials. So, you know, not just really just jumping out as something just like, you know, like crazy, but I, I think it's just more of like engineers kind of like adapting to, to today's you know, world with, with, you know, the, the different types of mindsets and stuff and, and where we are today. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, as you can tell, you've tapped into an audience that really loves this issue and uh, we admire all the work that you, you put together. And thanks for those resources as well, this guide to civil engineering uh, projection in and around New York City. I think a lot of us are gonna be looking for that book. Um, and I know that people have other questions, but I'm sure uh, we have to get moving on and you probably need to get in a cool place, right? So <laughs> thanks so much, Eric. Great, thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Yep, thank you so much, Eric. I was gonna say exactly what Kevin said. Other than engineers, you'll probably never find a more interested audience than a bunch of New York City tour guides to learn all about uh, the great landmarks and basically how the city works. So we really, really appreciate your time and uh, thanks also to Mel Wasserman for arranging this and bringing Eric to us for this really fascinating talk. So very well. Uh, yeah, thank you. With really? that, we are going to move on. So the next item on our agenda uh, is something the board started talking about a couple of months ago and we're excited to uh, put it forth to you guys as the membership today. And that is what Gannick's plans are to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And for this, uh, I'm going to turn it over to both Bob Gelber, Vice President, and Kevin Lawrence, Member at Large. Gentlemen. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm excited to tell you what we've been working on since May. Uh, first, I want to thank John Semlick because he was the original chair of this subcommittee, and we worked together until unfortunately he had to leave this project. And uh, I'm going to thank Kevin Lawrence now because he graciously jumped onto this and uh, he'll be talking about what he's overseeing in a few moments. So to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, Gannick will be coordinating two different types of programming. What I'm going to talk about for a couple of minutes, 
are the GANIC member only programs. It will only be available to our membership. First, there's going to be a class and then there's going to be walking tour. They're both going to be done by a gentleman by the name of Ed Welter, who is a close friend and colleague of mine. And for the last decade, he has been a docent trainer and project organizer at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. And just to keep it very simple, his class, which we're all, will be uh, about 50 people will be able to be invited to, is simply how was the World Trade Center built and why did it collapse? And everyone taking part in the program is going to have the original architectural plans of Yamasaki. And there'll be slides and we'll be going through it. I've taken part in the program previously and it's absolutely fascinating. And what will also be uh, very interesting to me and I think great is where the class is gonna be held. It's being hosted by Silverstein Properties, and we're gonna be in three World Trade Center on the 80th floor of their brand new, just opened a few weeks ago, uh, marketing center. Many GANIC members have been there with other fans. I've organized with Larry's personal filmmaker, Mike Marcucci has hosted us in the past prior to the pandemic when the marketing center was in building seven. So it's moved to a different building it's a much higher floor, and Ed will be conducting his program, his class up there. Uh, the date will be released of all of this in the next few weeks when we put up registration on Wild Apricot. Then Ed is going to do a walking tour, and the theme of the walking tour around the memorial pools is the World Trade Center then and now. And again, it's gonna be based on the original Yamasaki plans. It's not gonna be our average pool walk that most of us have done for clients for many years now. It's a project that Ed was given the go ahead by the Memorial Museum. He's been working on it for at least a year of wherever you're standing on that site, what was there on September 10th? before the attacks. And he's gonna offer that walking tour three times. So we try to get as many GANIC members that are available up there. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn the mic over to Kevin Lawrence, who's gonna talk about the public portion of what we'd like to do for this commemoration. Great, thank you so much, Bob. And thank you for all the great work. And that sounds like an incredible uh, set of programs that's gonna be available to our members. But in addition to having just members only GANIC events, we want to uh, tap into all of you guys and to have a, a, a request for proposals for giving free public tours that will be given from Friday, September 3rd uh, to Sunday, September 12th, we will not be giving tours on the 11th, but you will get a, a, a full description of what this will be. But I'm gonna put into the chat room now the link to the actual form that you can fill out and you can take a look at and start considering uh, for making a proposal to give a free walking tour. Now, please be aware that we don't want people actually being around the pools. I mean, Bob has a special relationship with, it, with his colleague there that can take us to the pools, but we are restricted from actually going to the memorial pools. Uh, so we want this to be all throughout the city. So please think of this very expansively. Think about you know the perspective from Staten Island, from New Jersey, everywhere. It doesn't even have to be within New York City, but just the vicinity. And we want all of our members to be engaged by this. And they are free tours. So please be aware that while you are, we want you to promote your, your own company at the end of it. We also want you to promote that this was a GANIC initiative. And we don't want you, we request that you not ask for any gratuities. Of course, if some are offered to you, you can accept them. Um, but uh, we do also have a strategizing meeting and I will put a link to that that will be for this Friday in which we're, we want to strategize the best way to actually promote this uh, to a larger audience because these will be free and open to the public. These are not just for GANIC members. And we wanna strategize the best way to reach 
the public at large to let them know that Gannick is giving back to the New York City community and to commemorate this with them uh, from your new unique perspectives and from the different experiences that you bring to your tours. Um, and if you have any questions uh, or concerns, you can always contact, of course, me or Bob. I'm going to put my email into the uh, into the chat room, uh, and we're happy to hear from any suggestions that you have to make this the fullest and most successful program, not only for this event but for Gannick as an as a volunteer organization that brings in so many different talents. Um, and I would just end by inviting any of my fellow board members to uh, add anything that I may have overlooked, because this is, you know, we have been thinking and discussing this for a long time. But as Bob said, I just sort of got onto uh, onto the train here uh, just a couple of days ago. And so I may have overlooked something. So uh, I'm looking um, I, I actually forgot to mention the virtual tours that we would also like to open up to the public. Uh, Mel Wasserman, for one, is um, an expert in the Israeli 9-11 memorial. He's going to be offering that virtually. Uh, and I have reached out to Shanksville. And I'm also in connection with the DC Guild to have one of their guides offer virtually uh, the Pentagon 9-11 memorial as well. And uh, we'll see how we move ahead with that. Great. Okay, great. Uh, any other board members have anything uh, they want to add? Yeah, so Kevin, Bob, and John, thank you guys so much for your efforts in this regard. Kevin really spoke to why we want to do this, uh, both uh, in terms of having the Gannick only functions, which obviously is a key part of our association, but we thought this was a wonderful opportunity for us to give back to the city of New York and the residents of New York. Although obviously if there were tourists in town, they can certainly hop on those tours uh, as well. But uh, especially with uh, the fact that sometimes the perception of tour guides is not the highest among the general public. We thought this would also be another great way to, to showcase our value and uh, to give back on such a momentous occasion. So we hope we will uh, hear, get lots of proposals from you guys. Uh, I'm sure an email will go out shortly, kind of explaining things in a little bit more detail. Uh, as Kevin said, he just kind of hopped on this in the last 48 hours or so. So he's uh, playing catch up a little bit, but uh, obviously time is of the essence if we want to get this properly promoted, we need to lock these in in the next couple of weeks so that we have several weeks to promote uh, the tours beforehand. And I'm sure everybody understands the, uh, the decision we made not to host any of those tours on the actual anniversary of 9-11, uh, but kind of the week leading up to it and also the Sunday after it, we thought was appropriate to have uh, those tours. So uh, look forward to hearing all of your proposals. Uh, don't be shy, don't think the idea is too silly or too strange or anything. Um, send us your ideas. Do it via the form, though. Don't just email Kevin all your proposals. We want to uh, do it through the form that, that Kevin just posted in the chat so that uh, we have an easy way to aggregate it and share it amongst uh, the people who will be deciding uh, which tours will be offered. So uh, with that, if there are no questions from the audience, we will move on. There is a question of, is the restriction of guides speaking at the pools temporary or permanent? I don't think any of us really know that. I do know that currently I have given a couple of Ground Zero tours and you are not permitted to go on to the memorial site. Uh, but I really, personally, I really feel you shouldn't um, and that you can get better perspective if you're at the Oculus, for example, uh, for the big groups anyway. Right, and, and our thinking just in terms of developing our tours for this week was that A, that week is probably gonna be, you know, on and off access all week with dignitaries coming through on the 20th anniversary. And like Kevin said, to, to also be, uh, you know, somewhat respectful and to show New Yorkers that there's more to the 9-11 story or show our guests, I should say, more to the 9-11 story than just what's down at the memorial. So that's why we would love to have ideas for the five boroughs in New Jersey and, and elsewhere in the area if, uh, if appropriate. So, um, so that's great. Again, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, John. And we look forward to uh, getting more information as this progresses. So, um, okay. So uh, next up, we do have an industry partner vote. And let me just... Uh, launch the poll 
Uh, our industry partner vote today is uh, actually not in New York City. It is the American Dream, uh, that beautiful mall out by MetLife Stadium, uh, which uh, finally has opened and reopened post COVID. Uh, this came via Harvey Davidson, who has a very strong relationship with their chief marketing uh, officer, a man named uh, Stan Kravitz, who used to be a Golden Touch. Uh, some of you might have dealt with him there. So uh, American Dream uh, is our uh, industry partner vote for tonight. So shortly in your inboxes, if you are a full member of Gannick, you will get a, uh, I just got mine, you will get uh, your ballot uh, and uh, please vote. We'll keep the poll open uh, until tomorrow morning and then we'll close it and uh, announce the results of the meeting, uh, of the vote. So, um, but uh, American Dream is our vote tonight. Does anybody have anything they wanna share about American Dream before we keep moving on? I myself have not made the journey over there, but uh, perhaps some others have. Uh, but in any event, uh, we know that a lot of people come here, a lot of our guests like to shop when they're in New York. So it's a, a good thing for us to know about and, and uh, avail ourselves of. Uh, well, so I have, I just wanna add, I have a friend who is, was there today and he said that they have an excellent food court. So something any good mall requires. So that's the recommendation I have via my friend, John. Thank you. There you go. So, uh, and I know that uh, I, I believe, I don't wanna speak out of turn, but I think Harvey might be talking to Stan about getting us a site inspection or fam tour over there at some point. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. Uh, so you should, if you're a full member, you should be receiving your ballots now. Like I said, just click on the link and cast your vote. Uh, but with that, we are going to move on to our next item on the agenda. And for this, I will call up Patrick Casey, uh, one of our secretaries uh, and the chair of our government relations committee, who has a call to action for our membership. So Patrick, please take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, everybody. It's an election cycle. Yippee. Now, one of the things that's going to happen as a result of this election cycle is there will be a major turnover in the New York City Council. <clears throat> half to two thirds of, uh, half approximately of the City Council will be term limited out. And there'll be a whole bunch of new faces on that council. And what is of concern to us in Gannick is with those term limits, taking people off the New York City Council, we're going to lose uh, the sponsors, 30 sponsors that we have for initiative 289A. For those who are not familiar with 289A, <clears throat> it is a piece of city council legislation <clears throat> that will ensure the presence of an, of an employee on the upper deck of a New York City tour bus when it's in operation. Before you raise any hackles, I'll get into it, why the, this particular legislation does not include the word guides. There is a reason for it. So what Gannick is asking is that you get in touch with your New York City Council member, your representative on the New York City Council and encourage them to get this initiative out of committee and out for a vote. Gannick spent a lot of time and effort over the past couple of years getting those 30 sponsors because of the pandemic that initiative wound up just sitting in committee. The council viewed that there were other more important matters to consider. But the fact is the city is reopening and we need to impress upon city council members that there has been one flow through throughout uh, the redevelopment of tourists, not only in, tourism, not only in our city, but across the country. Tourists feel safe when tourists feel they can travel safely. And the presence of someone up on that upper deck is the talking point for getting this legislation passed. If left to their own devices, the double-decker buses would leave it just with a driver, dealing with passengers and a canned tour, which is something obviously we don't need or want. And can you imagine a double-decker bus driver dealing with passenger needs and wants while driving through traffic? It is an accident waiting to happen. So the primary talking point that we are impressing upon everyone when you reach out to your council members is it is about pedestrian safety. It is about tourist safety. Safety is the selling point. Not guide so much and the reason for it is very simple. When initially proposed the use of the word guide raised the hackles of some on the members of city council that we were creating a protected 
class of worker. And this could have killed any attempt to get this bill done. So we did opt to go with an employee on the upper deck, that is how it's worded. But because of pre-existing requirements for hiring, it leads to that person being the guide. So while legislation can say guide, in practice, it would result in being the guide. Overnight and into tomorrow morning, we'll be posting through GANIC's announcements page and GANIC's social media, a template that will have talking points for writing and speaking with your council representatives and another piece of information that will include the names of all the current sponsors of that legislation. Uh, the author of the legislation is Yandris Rodriguez. And yes, we would like everyone to have a word with him to get this again out of committee and onto the floor for a vote before, er, before half the sponsors are lost to term limits. If anyone has a need for how to get in touch with your city council rep, just email governmentrelations at gannick.org. We'll be happy to provide that information. We have a database that can pull up who uh, you need to be getting in touch with. We would also sincerely appreciate if you get any feedback. In fact, we want you to get, we want to hear from you the feedback that you get from your council members. And if you're not getting feedback, Keep pushing and tell us eventually that you're not getting that feedback and perhaps we can focus some of that energies. We want this to be from our membership, through our membership to get this passed and know that government relations is there to be of assistance to everybody in doing so. And we need to hear your feedback so we can continue doing this from now until the end of the current city council term. So thank you. I look forward to hearing from everybody and questions, I guess there might be some questions in the chat that I should be looking at. Uh, I didn't see any questions, Patrick, oh, just okay. some, some comments more than anything else. Okay. Uh, Robin encouraged everybody to use social media platforms to reach out to these council members uh, and put some pressure on them as well. Patrick, do you have any sense, I know the election is in November, but I know we have to move on this quickly, but is there, is it, two weeks? Is it a month? Is it six weeks? Do you have any idea like at what time uh, it, it becomes too late and this will not be a, an issue for the current council? I think after the elections, uh, it will be a moot point. No one is really going to be caring. They're just going to be pretty much rolling out. They'll finish playing, running out the clock is the phrase I want. They're just going to be running out the clock. So it's uh, from now to the general elections. Gotcha. In early November. Okay, great. In early November. And uh, thank you, and thank you to Leonel, who I know has done a lot of work on this issue as well, and everybody on the Government Relations Committee. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many double-decker guides we have with us, but I know many of us, even if we're not double-decker guides right now, a lot of us started as double-decker guides. So this is a really important issue uh, and one that definitely deserves our full attention. So we are a trade you. association devoted and mandated to look after the interests of guides in the city of New York. This is exactly what we were created to do. So step up, make yourselves heard. And don't forget that over $60 billion comes into the city of New York through the industry of tourism. And every city council member has no problem spending that money on their pet projects and their initiatives within their districts. And we know that tourism is not loved by many New Yorkers and particularly those in city government. So we have to change that perception. You want that park built, you want that initiative that uh, provides another service for your constituents. Tourism pays for it and we are tourism. Be that clear, be that upfront. But I will say, and I perhaps I shouldn't have to say it, but I'll mention it anyway, be clear, be forceful, but always be professional and courteous with dealing with our council reps. They have egos just like the rest of us. So let's go people, let's do this and do this before the elections. Much appreciated, thank you. That's great, thank you, Patrick. And the only other thing I would add is tell your tour guide colleagues who are not GATIC members to join in on this initiative too. The more people the council hears from, the more likely it is to come to a vote before uh, the next council 
uh, is elected. So thank you again, Patrick, and to everybody on the Government Relations Committee who's been working on this for a long, long, long time. Uh, with that, we are now going to transition to our committee reports. We have just three committee reports tonight. So first uh, will be the Education Committee, and we will call Nina Mende, Chair of the Education Committee, up. Nina, I just made you a panelist, so you should be able to join as a panelist, I believe. There you are. Uh, we can't hear or see you yet, but I'm sure you will unmute and turn on your video in just a second trying to do the, oops, keeps getting off. There you are. Oh, here I am. Yeah, I was on my, on my phone, uh, okay. a little easier. Okay, but, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're, uh, this is a report from the Education Committee Corps. Uh, we have eight people that organize, including some wonderful board members, Bob, Bob Gelber, Kevin Lawrence, Jeremy Wilcox, and John Semlack, in addition to Lu uh, Lisa Puccio um, and uh, Minna Sharp and Susan Birnbaum. So uh, coming up, we, we have a lot of other, upcoming fam tours in the works don't haven't nailed down the dates all of them but one coming up right now is july 28th stop the presses with michael morgenthal and uh it's downtown manhattan's colorful newspaper history and michael i think you developed this tour right during the certification committee you had this idea and you've done it for the adventure club uh, right. Yeah, so this, uh, not to make this all about me, but yeah, this was my final project for the certification class, uh, which uh, my class, we ended right before the pandemic started. Uh, I have offered it as a virtual tour for a couple of different tour operators, but I'm so excited to start offering it as a walking tour. So, uh, so thank yeah. you, Nina. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're really, really excited about going on this. It's really a unique, I don't ever, you know, remember a tour being about the presses and my uh, my history in Gannick or, you know, as a tour guide. So it's great. Uh, we have another person who is in the process of doing music and art scene, uh, incorporating Max's Kansas City Mercer Arts Club, and that's Trish Sullivan. She's currently taking this certification class. So we're excited about that. That should be coming up in July as well. And of course, uh, a Newark bus trip uh, planned by Mark Landman and Andy S Sador uh, coming up in, I think, August or July. We haven't nailed down the dates, but that'll be our first bus trip. Everyone has to be vaccinated for, for health reasons. And I think it'll we could take up to 50 and it'll be fun to get out and explore Newark. And there's lunch and uh, all details will follow. Um, of course, the, well, the people, board members who are also on the education committee, uh, we're excited about what they're doing uh, with the 9-11. And if you want to do a, a FAM tour, I, I submit a committee report that's very wordy, and I'm, I don't read everything, but it, it, it has an index of all the past FAM tours. And, um, and also, there's an embedded link in the minutes that you can click on. And if you have a proposal idea for a FAM tour, you can click on it and, and do one for us. And uh, you'll find it, uh, I think now it's under resources and benefits. And many people who do fam tours, the Adventure Club or Bowery Boys have tried them out here. Emma Guest Gonzalez and, and Dave Gardner, his Titanic tour started way back years ago. So people have really developed and taken to and uh, do. And people sometimes when you do tours for other places, this is a place where you can get it out of your mouth uh, with a very, and you can, the audience starts at eight in-person people or, and it goes on. Another thing uh, that I want to mention is that our next education committee, we're now doing them once a month. Uh, they're virtual. It's going to be July 20th at 6, 6 p.m. And where the core meets, but uh, if you are interested in becoming involved in the education committee, just, you know, drop us an email. Uh, and I want to thank you for the contributors for last month. Uh, for the, and we've been doing all in-person fans, uh, which are amazing. And the, the, your fellow Gannick members, and sometimes we have guest uh, guides doing these, uh, they are our living resources and resident experts. So if you have to do, if you get a gig and you have to do a tour of a neighborhood, hey, reach out to your fellow guide who's an expert. Uh, and our experts this past month 
uh, have been Uptown in the Heights with Manuela Biondi, June 1st, June 4th, Bushwick Street R Tour with Jeremy Wilcox, What's Happening in Gowanus with Elliot Niles, East Village Music Venues of the 1970s, Long Gone But Not Forgotten, Anne McDermott, and Sunset Park Immigration and Landmarks with Joe Zablack, and Beyond Stonewall Celebrating Pride Month with Kevin Lawrence. So that these all happen. They were all in person. They're not on tape, but the people are still around. And if you get a lot of members together, maybe they'll do, a, you know, a tour for you. I know Joe likes to do tours for Danic members, so he's very generous with his time, and he's he's prolific. So, and one more thing: it's the summertime. You, uh, if you have a smartphone, uh, you can uh, log into. If you're a Danic member, you can log into any of our past professional development programs, webinars, virtual fam tours, and we have a whole bunch of virtual fam tours. So it's something that you can do on a train. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to read the paper, or look out the window or on the beach. Uh, and there's marketing. There are all kinds of wonderful things that we've been putting together and all the committees have been putting together. And our next guest speaker, and Michael, correct me if I get the name wrong, is from New York City and Company. Is it Fred Dixon? Yes, uh, Dina, our, we are confirmed. Our next, our guest speaker in August will be Fred Dixon, president and CEO of NYC and Company. Uh, some of you might remember Fred was one of our earliest uh, speakers when COVID hit, and we're excited to have him back now that things are, are bouncing back. So that's great. So that, that, that's really exciting. And we won't have an opening for guest speaker because the elections are coming up. And that's very exciting to nominate uh, future board members and then listen to their can candidate speeches, their presentations. And that's going to be October, November. The annual general meeting is also in September. So those three meetings, we won't have guest speakers. But starting in December, we start up again and for the rest of the year. So if you have an idea for a guest speaker or sometimes guest speaker works out uh, for a webinar, let us know and, um, and, uh, and we'll be happy. You can introduce them and, uh, and have your 15 minutes of uh, fame up, up there in front of Gannick members. But thank, uh, so thanks everyone. Great, thank you so much, Nina. And thank you to everybody on the Education Corps who uh, does so just, much work. Kevin, did you have something? Yeah, I just want I know Nina, Nina didn't mean to overlook this, but I just wanted to mention that uh, Robin actually gave a tour also of Murray Hill and uh, equestrian theme. So, oh, yeah, that was in May. Yeah, I do the June, but yeah. I want to give proper due credit where credit is. Yeah, yeah I, what I do is every month from the, the past June, but Robin is listed on the minutes last time, but yeah fantastic tour and she also did a virtual tour of the triangle shirtwaist fire which is if you haven't seen that virtual tour of that uh wonderful so robin yeah okay great thank you nina and thank you kevin appreciate that so you know we are going to take you off up as a panelist and put you back into 10 b thank you again uh so the next committee report is industry relations and that is me so uh, more me, why aren't you guys all so lucky? Uh, so uh, I appreciate it uh, and thank you. Uh, this is uh, the Industry Relations Committee report. Uh, our previous committee meeting was held on June 29th and we're planning to have our next committee meeting on Thursday, July 29th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. We're always looking for new members to join our committee. So please shoot an email to industryrelations at gannick.org uh, if you are interested in joining the committee, whether you can come to the meetings or not. There's plenty of work to be done, whether you can attend our meetings or not. But uh, in any event, I want to say thank you once again to Bob Gelber and to Harvey Davidson for their hard work in securing uh, in-person meeting venues for our upcoming membership meetings. In case you were late joining our meeting tonight and didn't hear my opening remarks, we are having our first in-person membership meeting since COVID on Thursday, September 9th. It'll be at the Museum for Jewish Heritage in Battery Park. And once again, only Gannick members who are fully vaccinated will be allowed to attend and there are no exceptions to this policy. For anyone who can't attend, the meetings will be live streamed. Uh, so stay tuned for more information on that, as well as locations of future meetings uh, for the rest of 2021. Uh, next up, Gannick's strategic affiliate, IATDG, the International Association of Tour Directors and Guides. Uh, asked us to remind all of you that uh, registration is still open 
for its big Tour Connect conference, which will be taking place this year, November 11th to the 14th in Atlanta. Uh, in fact, they have extended the early bird registration rate, which is $399. It was supposed to expire, I think, on June 30th, uh, but they've extended it till October 1st. So you still have a chance to register um, at the early bird rate through October 1st. Uh, I can tell you personally, I've been to all but one of the previous conferences and uh, they're really fun and really informative. And it's great to meet so many colleagues from around the, the country and around the world. Uh, and for, what, uh, for that rate for 399, you get an amazing amount of content, fam tours in Atlanta, networking, and there's also a job fair component as well. The job fair tends to be more for over the road tour directors, but they've been trying really hard to get more and more local guides represented at the job fair uh, as well. And some of you might remember that uh, also uh, the CEO of IATDG, Von Harden, uh, who himself is a tour operator based out of Texas, he was also one of our very first guest speakers after COVID last year. And uh, Von is a great advocate for tour directors and guides. Uh, so it's, if you can, it's definitely a worthwhile, um, worthwhile conference to attend. I know money's tight and I know people are getting bookings and things like that, but uh, I'm just gonna put in the chat, the two links that will show uh, registration and also more information on the conference. So, uh, so that's IATDG. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Bob Gelber and I are gonna be representing Gannick at NYC and Company's first post-COVID in-person meet and greet. And we're really excited to get out there and reconnect with tourism professionals from throughout the city and to let them know what Gannick is all about and connect them with Gannick. And uh, we use these things to try to find event venues for our meetings and develop fam tours and things like that. So uh, I appreciate Bob joining me there and uh, we're really looking forward to it. It's at the Margaritaville Hotel. So we'll let you guys know how that's looking as well. Um, speaking of NYC and company, I want you guys to know uh, if you didn't see the notice already, but last week uh, they launched their new marketing campaign which is called It's Time for NYC. Uh, I was on a call last week as part of the Allied Affiliates for Tourism Recovery. Uh, I sit on that uh, committee, so to speak, on behalf of Gannick, and a few things that are uh, important for you to know about this. Um, if you are uh, promoting stuff on social media here in New York, um, uh, use the hashtag, it's time for NYC, and there's no hyphen, uh, no apostrophe in it's for hashtag purposes, uh, but you also want to tag at NYC Go on your posts. Their social media reach is far greater than any one of ours individually. I'm going to go out on a limb to say that. So by using the hashtag and tagging at NYC Go, you have a better chance of promoting um, your tours to a wider audience. Uh, if you were using the previous hashtag, which was hashtag all in NYC, start using the new one. It's time for NYC uh, because that is really what they're going to be uh, working to promote. Uh, a big part of this program uh, NYC and company is holding a weekly sweepstakes where people can win a dream itinerary to New York City. They actually have two drawings every single week, and this is going to be running through the end of August. Uh, as part of this, um, anybody can create an itinerary. Uh, they had notable New Yorkers develop the initial itineraries as well as some employees of NYC and company, but literally anyone can do it. You don't have to be a member of NYC and company. So again, this is a great opportunity to kind of promote your uh, businesses uh, by developing one of these uh, itineraries. Now, the system is a little bit tricky. Uh, you can only select items that have already been preloaded onto uh, the NYC and Company website. And I just shared the link uh, where this program is discussed. Uh, we are talking about developing Gannick specific itineraries, but that should not stop any of you from going in there and there's a little uh, section where you can put about a sentence about who you are, who your tour company is, things like that. Uh, and it show how much we know and love about the city. And basically sweepstakes winners get airfare, three nights hotel and a $1,500 uh, MasterCard gift card to make their itinerary come true. Uh, so if you wanna learn about how to uh, submit your own itinerary on that web link I just shared, just scroll down to where it says design your epic stay in NYC and you can start clicking through and seeing what that is all about. And we'll post this in the, um, on the Gannick face, members Facebook page uh, as well. Speaking of that, they also developed a toolkit that can be accessed and downloaded 
uh, for imagery and social posts and uh, email signatures and things like that. Uh, we are in the process of uploading all of those resources to the GANIC photo database, which each and every one of you has, each and every one of you GANIC members has access to, and we'll share the link for that uh, in the GANIC members Facebook page as well, in case you don't have it, uh, because we uh, do have some people on the meeting today who are not GANIC members, and this is a perk just for GANIC members. Um, speaking of NYC and company, the last two items are also NYC and company. I uh, hope some of you are taking advantage of their uh, virtual tourism ready program. Uh, many of you have gone through the Tourism Ready program previously when it was in person, but they've been doing it virtually uh, starting in June. Uh, two sessions are down, two are left to go. It's being conducted by Jen Ackerson of Elon Marketing, who, great, who gave us a great series of PDPs last summer. Uh, the next session is uh, July 14th at 10 a.m. And um, I am pretty sure that you do not have to have attended the previous uh, two sessions uh, to attend this one. Uh, so if you're interested in signing up for session number three and learning also about session number four, which will be July 30th, I just put the link in the chat as well. Uh, and then last but not least, I just do want to give another shout out to Harvey Davidson, who uh, attended the NYC and Company board meeting on June 24th. Uh, he serves as a board, minute, uh, board member ex officio uh, at NYC and Company, which basically means he doesn't have voting rights, but he does that on behalf of Gannick. He did file a pretty extensive report, which is uh, will be part of the minutes uh, if you're interested in reading uh, what Harvey took away from the meeting. But there were two things that I just wanted to point out uh, before we say goodbye. Uh, he did speak about how the guest, he did mention the guest speaker that day was form, one of the former police chiefs, Terrence Monahan, who is now a senior advisor to uh, for NYC recovery and safety planning for the New York City Economic Development Council. Uh, his job is to coordinate various city agencies to make the city operate the way it should, especially for tourism. Uh, and during his talk to the board, he mentioned how more police are now being assigned to the subway system and to Penn Station. We've certainly seen all the news about uh, homeless issues and crime issues spiking around the city, but especially on our transportation systems. Um, he also mentioned there will be more professional mental health workers assigned to work with the homeless and finding housing for them. Harvey did ask a question about the overcrowding on the Brooklyn Bridge, and Monahead said uh, that he would look into it, and this is the type of problems he's trying to address and was eager to hear more about other issues. So uh, I didn't find his specific contact information, but I'm sure if you go to the NYC EDC website, uh, you can find ways to reach out to uh, Mr. Monahan and tell him what issues uh, he's, you think are important for uh, him to be working on. Uh, in addition, the last thing I'll mention is uh, we shared in the GANIC members Facebook page uh, earlier today, a PDF presentation from Adam Sachs, who is with Tourism Economics. And it's all about the numbers behind the expected recovery in tourism travel, both here in New York City and around the United States. So if you haven't already seen that, please take a look at it. Uh, it's a PDF that's been shared to the GANIC members Facebook page. Uh, with that, I think that covers everything I want to talk about in my report. So uh, if there are no questions, we can move to our final committee report of the uh, evening, and that is membership. So uh, let's call Derek Chan up as a panelist. Um, okay, so Derek, I just promoted you to panelist. So when Derek appears on the screen, Derek is our chair of our membership committee and uh, Derek will uh, talk all about uh, what their committee has been up to. So Derek, uh, right now we can't see you or hear you. So if you wanna unmute and get your video going, there you are live from the streets of Queens, here's Derek Chan. That's right, I'm down off of uh, Steinway Street right now. So hello everybody, it's Derek Chan. I'm your uh, membership committee chair. And uh, just want to give a special welcome to all of our uh, first time viewers, uh, whether you're a new member or not so new member or not yet a member. And also a special welcome to our long time regular viewers. We're always happy to uh, have you with us, even if we can't always see you uh, face to face. Um, I do want to note uh, a few things. First of all, if you're not a member and you are interested in becoming a member, now is a really great time to do so because right now, the membership dues are prorated. So normally our annual dues for this year are $125, but right now they're prorated 50%. So you get a 50% discount if you join as a member now. So the dues would be $62.50. And then also, GANIC is no longer charging an initiation fee. 
So there's nothing extra that you'd pay beyond that. You don't even have to pay a credit card fees. So now's a really great time to join, to become a member if you've been thinking about it. Uh, this is your sign that uh, now is a great time to do so. And you can just go online to the website, Gannick.org. All the information about how to get started is, uh, is out there. I do also want to recognize our newest provisional members. We have three new provisional members. Uh, those would be Joe Cohen, Russ Norfleet, and Svetlana Tezier. Welcome as our newest Gannick members. And I also want to note for our current members, we do have uh, the benefits page on our website. That's um, gannick.org slash benefits. So if uh, you haven't been there recently or you're not aware about that at all and you are a member, just log on to the website. It has all the information about uh, everything really Gannick related, links to the uh, Gannick members only Facebook page, information about fam tours, the uh, pre-recorded PDPs, pre-recorded virtual fam tours, uh, information about the uh, information about uh, really everything Gannick related. And if you're hearing a lot of noise in the background, it is a little bit noisy. I do apologize for that. Our current uh, active Gannick membership is now current three, 321 members. Uh, and, um, and that's about it. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask me now, or also you can follow up uh, via email at uh, membership at Gannick.org. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Derek, I appreciate that. And uh, yes, uh, somebody thought you were either on a T-Rex farm or uh, God knows what's happening out there in Queens, the wilds of Queens, so to speak. So uh, we appreciate it, thank you so much. Um, so I saw a couple of people made comments uh, about the links that I shared uh, not opening properly. I just clicked through all of them and all four opened fine for me, but I will make sure to post those again in the Gannick members Facebook page. One thing about IATDG, that announcement was actually sent out as an email blast last week. So if you go to gannick.org and look under announcements, you can find all that information there uh, as well. Um, so with that, I think we are just about done. Uh, Michael, yeah. uh, Sarah has a question for Derek, actually, that she wants a reminder about uh, how the transition from provisional to full membership. What do people have to do for full membership, Derek? Yeah, so it's uh, very easy to do. So, so first of all, everybody starts out as a provisional member. And then after becoming or being a provisional member for a minimum of one year, and also have attended a minimum of four membership meetings, so that's whether these virtually or in the past or in the future, uh, in-person meetings, and then also getting two letters of recommendation from current full members, then you would um, become a full member. And uh, any questions about that, you can also feel free to reach out to me directly, as I mentioned, the email membership at gannick.org. And then also, if uh, you forgot all that information, just go back to the gannick.org slash benefits site, and then all that information is also listed there as well. Great, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Derek. Appreciate that. Um, okay. so. I think we are just about done with our July membership meeting. Before we close the meeting, any other thoughts, comments from either members of our audience or any members of the board? Okay, so uh, next meeting is August 4th. Like we said, uh, Fred Dixon from NYC and Company will be our featured speaker. And uh, just stay tuned for all the other cool stuff that was discussed tonight by board members and by our committee chair. So thank you so much, guys. Stay safe out there. Keep working, keep uh, repping Gannick, keep hydrated, and we'll uh, see you guys all soon. Good night.